Um, Mr. Mena, one of the great joys, I, I'm sure, as a father, is seeing three children, all three of your children, follow your footsteps into the law. All of them are involved in law-related jobs. Is that, a, is that truly a, been a joy for you? It's been a joy and also a shock. Uh, we didn't uh, expect any of them to become lawyers. Uh, they've all gone to different law schools. Uh, Nell went to the University of Chicago. Uh, Martha went to Yale. Uh, Mary went to Stanford. And they've all gone off in different directions and we're, uh, each day we're astonished at uh, what they do and how they do it. It's, a, it's one of the great uh, rewards, I think, uh, to, to see that at our age and stage in life. Being a lawyer has placed you in a very unique position to witness and be a part of so much American history. Do you, do you agree with that? Well, I do. I think the most exciting experience I had was during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962 when I was called to the White House to arrange for President Kennedy's speech to be heard in Cuba because the Voice of America was being jammed by the Russians. And I was asked to arranged for eight American commercial radio stations whose signals reached Cuba to carry the voice of America, but do all this surreptitiously and without any notice. And it worked out, and the president invited me back to the uh, White House the next day to tell me it worked. <laughs> and I said, um, I said, fine. He said, well, I want to continue it. So we did it the entire week uh, and uh, until the crisis ended. That was the most exciting experience I had. You're, of course, very well known for your vast wasteland speech. Um, did you get uh, a reaction from the president for, for when, you, when you made the speech, when you, you offered those remarks? Did you get a, an immediate reaction from the president? No, I didn't. But oddly enough, I did get an immediate reaction from his father. Uh, at, home, at home that night, I had two phone calls. One was from Edward R. Murrow, who was then the head of the USIA, and he said, you stole my speech. <laughs> and the other was from the president's father, who called me up and said, uh, I told my son that your speech was the best speech since the inauguration, and he said, and you keep it up. If anybody gives you any trouble, he says, you call me. Goodbye. And he hung up. And that was the, uh, I did not hear directly from the president. You transcended uh, the Stevenson and Kennedy camps like few others did. Having worked for Governor Adlai Stevenson, you were in his counsel's op office, I believe. Uh, and then you were head of the FCC under President Kennedy. Many in the, in the Kennedy administration probably saw you as a Stevenson partisan. If, if that's true, that you were seen as a Stevenson partisan, how did you overcome that? Well, they also knew that I had urged Adley not to run again. Adley had run, and I'd been with him in the 52 and 56 campaigns, and I felt that was enough and urged him not to run for president in 1960 and in fact had urged him to take Jack Kennedy as his running mate in 1956 and to support Kennedy in 60. Uh, he didn't agree with that. So, But uh, President Kennedy uh, uh, appointed all the members of our Chicago law firm to the government. Uh, Adlai, uh, Bill Blair became an ambassador. Bill Wirtz became undersecretary, later secretary of labor. And I went to the FCC, and Adley said, I'm sorry, I have only one law firm to give to my country. <laughs> uh, you've also been quite the visionary, just focusing on broadcasting for the moment. You, you were a visionary when it came to um, how the medium of television could be used. Uh, and in particular, you also um, you, you saw the use of satellites in ways that others, others didn't. Um, how, did you, how did you get focused on the issue of satellites? One of the uh, senior commissioners came to me the first day I was in the job, and he said, do you know what a communication satellite is? And I said, 
no, I don't. He said, and he groaned. He said, I was afraid of that. He said, I can't get anybody interested around here. And he said, it's the one place where we're ahead of the Russians in space. And he sa I said, well, if you promise to teach me, I will take this on, which I did. And we got the legislation through Congress. In fact, one time, I testified 13 times before the various congressional committees. At one time, one of the senators said, uh, uh, what do you think we should do to stay ahead of the Russians with this technology? I said, that's very easy. I said, let's get the Russians to adopt the Administrative Procedures Act. How did that go over? <laughs> <laughs> but we did get it through, and it worked, and we were the first country to get satellites uh, working. Of course, this changed the world. Uh, as you look to the future, what excites you the most about the way that we will be communicating? I think it's the marriage of television and computers. I think the uh, uh, way we see television in the future will be mostly on our computer, just as you're doing with this program for the Illinois Bar Association. And I think you'll see it when you want to see it, not when it's uh, broadcast. And I think that uh, the best days really lie ahead. As you look at the way that broadcasting is done today, is there anything that makes you yearn for the good old days? Well, I'm very proud of one thing. that uh, I made a lot of mistakes like everyone else along the way. But one thing I'm very proud of, and that is we really started public television. And now today, there's a public television station that reaches every home in America. And I think it's been a major contribution. What, what led you to see the value in, the, in public support for a network? I, f I feel that television, if used properly, is a great medium of education. And people learn from it. Uh, kids learn from it. Uh, old people benefit from it. So I regard uh, television as a way to educate and inform and uh, inspire, in, in uh, Edward R. Murrow's words. And I, I think that uh, what I tried to do was to enlarge choice for the American people. We opened up cable television, we opened up UHF television, satellite television, public television, to give people a wider range of choice. Uh, we've succeeded in that, certainly. Uh, at the same time, our standards have de deteriorated, so we've paid a price for it. But uh, overall, I think it was the right decision. By my count, you've been licensed to practice law for 63 years? That's correct. What, if you could sum it up, um, what changes have you uh, been witness to in those years in terms of the way that our profession provides uh, legal services to the public? Well, the technology has changed the practice enormously. The, uh, I remember when I started out uh, making a phone call to New York or California was a big deal. Uh, there were no such thing as xerography. There were uh, carbon copies of papers. Uh, it's also the, the practice has become not only uh, national but now international. Uh, some firms like ours are all over the world. Uh, it's, it's, it's a completely different kind of uh, practice than existed uh, at that time. You knew everyone in your law firm. Uh, you uh, had a relationship with clients that was uh, very direct and intimate. Uh, I'm not so sure that all these changes are for the better. Okay. How do you feel so far? I think it's great. All right. Um, Got it? Okay. Do you want me to, um, you want to say anything about law student debt? You want me to bring up what Martha has done on that? Fine. Okay. Let's do that. Mr. Minow, your, your daughter, uh, who is the dean of the Harvard Law School, has um, written on the subject of uh, the successive law student debt uh, that we're seeing in so many recent graduates of the law schools. And as you know, at the Illinois State Bar Association, that issue has been a very important focus this year. Um, what are your observations about the impact of law student debt on the delivery of legal service? 
Well, I thank you for your leadership on this issue because it's a crucial issue for the future of the profession. Uh, daughter Martha was just here last weekend. She came in to be with her mother for Mother's Day. <coughs> we were talking about it. I think uh, these kids <coughs> simply cannot afford to take on that kind of debt, uh, can run as, into six figures and, uh, and still uh, uh, have a, a human life for themselves and their families. So this has got to change. We need young lawyers. We need, I, I believe, despite what I read in the paper, I believe we need more lawyers, not less lawyers, because there are a lot of people who are not served well today by, with legal services that they need. And we've got to do something about this debt issue or we will not have young lawyers uh, providing the service to the public that's needed.